Thank you. Um, so the theme of today's plenary is harnessing local capacity and context to sustain risk reduction efforts. In particular, this plenary will focus on underserved communities worldwide. You will hear directly from eight of our team members spread across several countries. They will share their experiences and perspectives, particularly around key principles for sustaining risk reduction efforts in their communities. They will highlight their efforts by, to harness local capacity and leverage local strengths and networks by engaging people across the community spectrum, including youth in preparedness and mitigation programs. So this is what our um, session will look like today. I will start off by providing some brief background information on our organization and in particular, why we exist and our focus. I will then talk through key principles for sustaining risk reduction efforts that we have learned as an organization over the years. This will help frame the discussion with our panelists. We will then move on to, in to introduce our panelists and specific questions for them. I will then end with key takeaways. Um, if we have time at the end, we will be able to take a few questions live, but if not, we're also happy to answer any questions via email after the session. So why do we exist? The graph you see on the left compares deaths from natural disasters in high and upper middle income versus low and lower middle income countries. And what you see is a stark difference in deaths between the two income categories. A big reason for this is that measures to protect people have been implemented for decades in richer countries. Many of these proven measures have not been implemented in poor countries, meaning that in comparable natural hazard events, more people die in poor countries versus rich countries. In fact, when we look at total disaster deaths, we find that over 90% of disaster fatalities occur in developing countries. And although we know that preventative measures are the most effective way at saving lives, when we look at the distribution of worldwide aid for natural disasters, we see that less than 4% goes towards preventative measures that keep people safe in the first place. The vast majority of support goes towards reactive measures, including emergency response, recovery, and reconstruction. We as an organization were created to address this funding and attention gap as well as the disproportionate impacts in poorer countries. Geohazards International, GHI, we're a nonprofit founded 30 years ago this year, so founded in 1991, with headquarters in California. Our mission is to end preventable death and suffering from natural disasters in the world's most at-risk underserved communities. Our approach focuses on proactive preventative measures we always focus on applying the latest science and engineering. We aim to be a catalyst for long lasting impacts. So we incorporate aspects of social science to help answer questions like, what does it really take for a community to adopt a culture of safety and proactive thinking? And we've always emphasized strong local engagement and presence. Ultimately, we want to stay ahead of disasters, which really requires a paradigm shift as most attention is still on reacting to the latest disaster. We champion for a vibrant future for all in which people are protected and prepared ahead of natural hazard events and climate impacts. We have experience in over 20 low and middle income countries and we currently have staff in five countries plus headquarters in the United States. We traditionally focused on geological hazards like earthquakes, landslides, and tsunamis, but more recently have expanded our work to start addressing climate-induced hazards as this has become a dire need in a lot of the communities where we're working. Our four focus areas include schools. Here we don't just work on the structural safety of school buildings, but we also work closely with principals, teachers, and engage children and youth. This focus area is particularly important to us as children are among the most vulnerable sections of our society who don't decide for themselves which schools they go to or how safe their schools must be. Mentoring and training, which we embed into everything we do. You're here examples of our learn by doing approach where we engage local stakeholders and partners as key participants of our programs. The intent is to build capacity by giving local professionals and stakeholders the opportunity to learn and apply new skills. 
novel approaches. We work in areas with limited resources, but they also have their own unique strengths. We consider local limitations and opportunities to co-develop innovative approaches. Hospitals and healthcare facilities provide some of the most important services in a post-disaster setting. Beyond focusing on structural safety, we also work with healthcare facility staff to improve the ability for them to function post-disaster and to be ready for mass casualty response. Preparedness is so important. From family preparedness to specific sector preparedness, we work to inspire safer practices across the community spectrum. Risk assessments and scenarios. We use these to help local stakeholders understand the risk specific to their community and develop recommendations on what can be done. And finally, policy and planning. Much of this feeds in from our understanding of the risk, what can be done about it, and making sure to integrate this into long-term policies, planning, and development to ensure a safer future. Now I'd like to move on to share key principles to sustaining risk reduction efforts that we have learned as an organization over the past 30 years. I will only give you some brief descriptions to set the stage as you will hear more of these detailed examples, more detailed examples on how these are applied from our panelists themselves. First, consider the social context. Who makes decisions? What are the various roles of community members and organizations? What are the existing networks and can they be leveraged and are a strength for the community? These are all questions that are so important to ask from the very beginning. On the same vein, disasters are not the same for everyone. How do we ensure that our efforts don't exclude segments of the population? The aim should be for inclusive lasting solutions by engaging diverse voices. What does this look like on the ground? Here are two quick examples. On the left, you see a photo showing women's informal networks in rural Nepal. These networks are a strength in these communities and can be leveraged to help build disaster resilience and help with messaging. On the right, you see the one school that had been unintentionally left out of annual earthquake drills that started in 2013 in Bhutan. This school is for visually impaired students and the complexities of their particular context had not been taken into account. Once this gap was identified, we worked with the school to develop specific plans specific to their situation and to train them to evacuate the visually impaired students safely. Communicate and inspire. It's so important to share information in a way that is clear, relevant to daily life and local issues, and it needs to be actionable. Delivering information to people via channels that they already use and trust is an effective strategy. Here are some examples from the field. On the left, you see a disaster-themed slam contest in Haiti. Slams, which are rhythmic poems with a beat playing in the background, are very popular. Youth participants here were so thrilled to take part and showcase the slams they had come up with. On the right, you see our GHI staff member on a popular radio show in Nepal talking about earthquake safety with Deputy Mayor of Amargadi, who's on the left. She has now become a champion of resilience. Advanced local capabilities. It's important to equip people across the community spectrum from government officials to technical professionals to medical staff to educators to educators to construction workers. They all play a role in community resilience. They are the ones that can sustain safer practices in the long run. For these reasons, we focus on mentoring and investing in people. Here are some examples from the field. On the left, you see hospital staff training for a disaster in Bhutan. The aim is to identify crisis roles, practice with simulations, secure important equipment, map evacuation, and plan for backup water, power, communications, and critical supplies in advance of a disaster. Ultimately, we're trying to improve the post-disaster functionality of the hospitals. And on the right, you see the engagement of local university students during our process of mapping landslide hazards in Northeastern India. And as much as possible, we aim to engage local students and professionals in hands-on training. Cultivate trust. This is so important. We invest in community relationship. And as part of this, we ask ourselves, who does a community trust? And on the flip side, who does a community not trust? The answers to these questions can vary quite widely by community. 
Partnering and working alongside groups and people that the community trusts can be very powerful. Here are some examples from the field. On the left, you see our GHI team working alongside local trusted leaders in Nepal. And on the right, you see youth engaging with churches in, Cap in, ha in Haiti, one of the most trusted and respected groups in the country. Connect leaders with targeted expertise, depending on the particular needs. This can be very helpful, especially when dealing with natural hazards like earthquakes that don't happen all that frequently. So bringing in lessons learned from other places that have experienced similar challenges and issues can be incredibly valuable. These experts can help advise and work collaboratively with local and national experts to help inform good decision making. Here are some examples. On the left, you see our international landside expert, our GHI mitigation officer in India, who you'll hear from today, and a landside expert from the national government, all collaborating to better understand local landside hazards in India. On the right, you see Bhutanese government agency representatives connecting virtually with risk modeling experts to better understand their building vulnerabilities. And last, some lessons learned. First, there seems to be an overemphasis on tools and products. Like, don't get me wrong, these are really important, but process and social capital are not emphasized enough. Who is at the table from the beginning and throughout, not just at the end? Who has a voice in setting the priorities? What assumptions are being made in models? Do they reflect local conditions? And similarly, who are the people and networks who will be using and sustaining the tool or product after a particular project is over. It is these people who are key to determining how effective that particular tool or product will be in the long run. We also know that solutions dropped in by outsiders rarely last. And similarly, cookie cutter solutions that don't consider the local context rarely provide adequate and effective solutions. An outsider's approach of coming in to save people can be problematic. At worst, it can deprive local people's dignity and does not recognize rich local knowledge. And at best, it's simply not sustainable. And now it's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to our panelists who will share their perspectives from countries across the globe. You will hear from team members in their native countries of Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Nepal, and India. They come with diverse perspectives, not only geographically, linguistically, and culturally, but also from multiple educational backgrounds, disciplines, and work experience. They'll bring forth their perspectives as engineers, disaster managers, social worker, medical doctor, lawyer, working across many areas, including community engagement, technical training, lateral leadership, and resilience planning. They have experience collaborating closely with multiple stakeholders, including government agencies, schools and youth, and the health sector. Collectively, their efforts span local, national, cross-border, and regional levels, and address risks from multiple hazards, including earthquakes, cyclones, landslides, and tsunamis. Many of our speakers today are in areas where internet connection is very unreliable, or they have very limited bandwidth. So in an effort to make sure that their voices and experiences are clearly heard, all their responses have been pre-recorded, but they are with, with us here live. I hope that you find that the diversity in perspectives from our panelists today makes for an, an enriching exchange. And with that, I'm gonna ask Jen if she could share um, her screen so that we can watch the videos. We will be playing the videos from Jen's screen. Okay, great. Thank you, Jen. So first, we're going to start off with Garmalia Mentor William, based in northern Haiti in her home city of Cap Haitian. Before we jump in to hear from Garmalia, I want to give you a little bit of context on Haiti. In the last 20 years or so, natural disasters took more lives in Haiti per million people than any other country in the world. Over 35% of schools have been damaged or destroyed in recent events including 2008 tropical cyclones and floods, 2010 Haiti earthquake, 2016 and 2016 Hurricane Matthew. Over 50% of the population is below the poverty line. 
and nearly half the population is under 20 years old, so a very young population. It's expected to be one of the countries to suffer the most from climate change impacts, which it's already starting to experience. It's an isolated island nation and is suffering from a lot of political instability and rest, as I'm sure a lot of you have seen in the news. Bottom line, Haiti is a very challenging context, but there's a huge need. So now let's hear from Garmalia. Garmalia is our Haiti representative and in her role, she leads all on the ground work in her country. She has been working with us since we started working in Haiti in 2013. Garmalia is both a medical doctor and a disaster risk management specialist. And her experience combines 15 years in public health and disaster risk reduction efforts in multiple contexts and countries. We will now hear directly from Garmalia. Oh, I, I don't think I don't think we can hear the audio, Jen. You're not hearing it. So with my name is Specialist. I'm an action oriented emergency professional who is cross culturally competent by gaining hands on experience in multiple countries and contexts. I have also led several multi hearts of trainings of professional and non professional audiences. I'm Haiti representative and I efficiently coordinate multiple projects, manage team and resources in Haiti. Being part of a vulnerable community. And as a doctor, I've been able to observe the impacts as well as long lasting sequels caused by the 2010 earthquake, especially on school children. I've been able to bring help to transfer victims from the 2010 earthquake in Capetian. I feel concerned about the lack of public awareness and decided to contribute personally until I start working with GHI when I can reach more students. And being an adept at public education, I'm well versed on training young and adults regarding disaster related topics as well as health related ones. I think all of this is key to ensuring readiness for potential emergency situation that might hit the most vulnerable communities. <laughs> in the last two years, the political situation in Haiti has been worsened. So um, to avoid delay, we always be informed and anticipate any potential type of crisis that might disrupt our field work. We prioritize, prioritize, and always have a tentative date and address as needed. We anticipate work that can be done home-based when field work is prohibited. We grasp any single day of a week to launch intensive and hands-on trainings. We meet current elected officials, launch project activities, and come back to meet new elected ones as there might be election delays. We plan to work with reachable groups such as SCART out of schools when schools shut down. And we also want summer activities to catch up with missing days. We launch disaster themed slam contacts at schools to help kids focus and make research on disaster with management topics. We do not wait for disaster to happen. We work before disaster strike in vulnerable communities. We understand local conditions before training key stakeholders and vulnerable groups. After the trainings, the trainees develop tailored messages for their own community guided by GHI and national experts. We cultivate a group of engaged children and youth to develop creative ways to increase disaster resilience as nearly half the population is under 20 years old. We also bring together different sectors that used to work separately, such as religious denominations. We understand local conditions first, such as geologic hazards, as well as other coastal hazards that most of the time strike. We study structural vulnerabilities, as well as heavy objects falling inside and outside of the buildings. We base our approach on human factors by surveying social and economic studies 
human behaviors during past earthquake. And we engage champions and, and community leaders. Force, details matter. That's why we keep observing. We notice that there are many language, language variants within the same country. We, every city is more receptive to a particular channel of communication than, other, than another. So we make sure that we transfer messages in the local context. Um, in CAP, they use soundtrack for obituary, which is different from other cities and especially for Ensemble. We also realize that peer mentors are most effective at promoting change. That's why we have developed a child focus on a child-led project in order to teach or to train uh, young, young people. We also realize that uh, stakeholders own and sustain our project activity as they got involved at the right beginning. At the time of training, we not only teach about earthquake safe construction, but we also consider other coastal hazards that mostly hit Haiti, such as hurricane. So our training tackles both earthquake and hurricane safe construction. And even for COVID, we have developed we have created a COVID action teams in order to help the population. Uh, as you know, uh, this was the main concern uh, at this moment. We also uh, realized that young people become less vulnerable when empowered and get involved. Uh, religious representatives that have been trained by us become more inclusive regarding adepts their own adepts with disabilities. Veronica, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so yes, wow, that's incredible to see all the amazing work that the team in Haiti has managed to continue with, even though these are very difficult times for the country. We're so grateful to have Garmalia leading the work on the ground and wish our friends in Haiti safety and more peaceful times. Um, so now we'll move actually to our, our, our next speaker, who's also in Haiti. Uh, this is Jeff de Vilme, who is based in the southern coast of the island in his hometown of Ansavo. Jeff de Vilme is a field officer, and in his role, he oversees all the work uh, on the ground work in Ansavo. He has many years of experience in community development programs for disaster preparedness, education, safe water, and public health to strengthen rural populations at risk. We will not hear directly from Jeff Day. My name is Jeff de Devilme. I live in Ansavo, a city in the south of Haiti. That's my home city. As educational background, I have a PS in development science. I'm a lawyer. I'm a master degree student in business law. I'm also a professor. I'm working for JHI as field officer. My motivation to work with my community that because it's often victim from natural disaster, hurricane, earthquake, because some of them do not know what to do before, during, and after a natural disaster. In this case, I get involved on training, sensitization, in order to see how I can help to reduce death or other loss. Ansavo is a vulnerable city. It's often victim from natural disasters, earthquakes, floods, hurricanes. In 1963, Hurricane Flora destroyed the lower town of Ansavo. Ansavo is a city with high seismic risk. In 1960, during an earthquake, 124 houses were destroyed and after there was a tsunami. 
another earthquake struck this community in 1952, where six people died. Savo was also affected by the 2010 earthquake, even if there is no death, but some houses were destroyed. 2015, several small earthquakes tried this community, and the population was so panicked because they do not know what to do. Our program helped the community to have a better understanding and make them know what to do before, during, and after an earthquake and tsunami. Authorities and stakeholders get involved to elaborate message for the population. Each group has the responsibility to synthesize its peer. For example, an ensemble fishermen prefer being synthesized by the peace and seas of local authority. I have seen that young people are more enthusiastic than expected and they get involved. Ansavo and cooperation are in the same country, but in the communication campaign, the approach is different for these reasons. The linguistic variations, people and cooperation do not speak the same way to those in Ansavo. A message here with encapation could be not clear for those in Ansavo. People could be more interested in the tone and seed of the content. Other things, for example, in Ansavo, we can say the population during encapitalization do not put the hard objects in the Galata, but in encapitalization there is no Galata. What is the difference on the size of the city? Ansavo is a smaller city and Capetian is a big one. So it's easier in Ansavo to use more communication channel during a communication campaign than Capetian. The channel often used in Ensavo for sensitization are door to door, sound shops, banners, and radio show. Thank you, Jefta, for your commitment to your community. It's really wonderful to see all those activities. And it's also amazing to hear how there can be significant differences that influence the effectiveness of programs, even within such a small country like Haiti. I think this is so important to keep in mind in any program as we I think often mistakenly assume that if someone is from a particular country or region, they will understand the context of any location within that particular country or region. Okay, with that, um, let's move on to our next panelist, which is in the neighboring Dominican Republic, uh, where Delca Espinal uh, represents our most recent program. We just started working in the Dominican Republic two years ago. So um, Delca Espinal is our Dominic Dominican Republic representative and is based in Santiago de los Caballeros. In her role, she oversees all on the ground work in the country. And she started working with us at the end of 2019, right before the pandemic hit. So, it, she's had to take on a lot of unprecedented challenges from day one, and she is taking them on so well. Um, Delca Espinal is a structural engineer with many years of experience in seismic vulnerability assessment, as well as in working closely with at-risk communities and local government. Before joining GHI, she was executive director of the Dominican Foundation for Risk Management, an NGO that supports Santiago de los Caballeros municipality in developing its disaster resilience strategy. We will not hear directly from Delca. Hello, everyone. I'm Delca Espinal from Santiago de los Caballeros, the Dominican Republic. I'm a civil engineer with a master's degree in structures and also a postgraduate diploma in planning for local development, land use planning, and risk management. I'm working as your author's representative in the Dominican Republic. And at this moment, we are supporting practical family preparedness in four communities in the north part of the country and also in two communities in Haiti. Responding to your question, Veronica, about what drives me to do my work, I believe that is my, is my desire to serve others. Since I was a teenager, 
I have worked closely with some humanitarian organizations as volunteers. Some of these organizations are the Red Cross, UNICEF, Plan International, and World Vision. In these 20 years working in engineering and also combining with the disaster preparedness and the emergency management, something that I really enjoy is work closely with the communities. And here I have the opportunity to combine my knowledge and my expertise with something that I really enjoy, help the people in my local communities, mainly in vulnerable conditions. In my experience working with communities, some aspect of some effective ways to make long-term progress with the communities are related with four aspects. One of them is the community engagement. I think that we have to engage with the community with the early stage of the projects. When I started to work in disaster preparedness 20 years ago, I don't involve in the community needs. Sometimes my relation there was only to present the project there. Through the years, I understand the very value that is engage the community. For that reason, when I try to plan or design a project, I go to the community, make some workshops, and also I make brainstorming sessions. And for me, it's very valuable when I can receive feedback for, from the community and also I can hear their opinions. And also I know this sense of ownership that they take with the project. And for me, it's very valuable. Other aspect that we have to consider is to try to build confidence or try to construct trust in the community. Uh, develop supporters and make sure that the needs and wishes of your stakeholders are taken in consideration or are taken in account. Because sometimes when I go to the communities with a new project, the people is joyful because uh, they have the experience of another project there that was implemented by me. Um, they think that it's really important for them because I'm involved in this project. For that reason, for the trust is very important for me. Another aspect that I have to consider when we have this kind of long-term uh, relationship with the community is try to ensure that our project respond to the local needs. Sometimes the decision makers and the engineers, we believe that the people need that project, but sometimes when you go to the community, you can experiment that they, this project is not respond to the immediately needs of this community. And for that reason, we have to be sure that the, the local needs of the communities are in consonance with your project. Another aspect that we have consider that I believe that is important is understanding the community context. We don't have only have to think in the engineer of environmental issues. For me, it's really important the social and economy and demography and other aspects that are really important in a project. For that reason, when I start a project, my in the early stage I contract a sociologist that is the person that can better understand the community campus. I believe that these four aspects for now are essential to, to make some long-term progress with the communities because sometimes based in these four uh, uh, topics, we can make a successful or not successful project. Haiti and the Dominican Republic not only share the Hispaniola Island, we also share similarities and challenges. For example, both countries are isolated islands. Both countries have low incomes and limited resources, but also both countries have similar hazards, for example, earthquakes. We share some seismic fault, for example, during the King of Platinum Garden, 
that in 2010 caused the earthquake in Haiti. But also from June to November, every year, we are under the influence of the hurricane season. We have extreme events, high meteorological events also, and floods and landslides in some areas in both countries. For example, last week we have the influence of tropical storm Elsa that caused damage in some countries. And the reasons I believe that we have to create opportunities for coordinate and make disaster risk reduction plans between the two countries. In recent years, any efforts are conducted in both countries, but I think that are not enough. We need more collaboration. We need to work together and make some plans uh, with, uh, with the help with the collaborative political relationship. For example, one opportunity that I think that is very valuable at this point in Dominican Republic and also in Haiti, I'm making the studies in the extension of both. And I think that this research is very valuable for both countries. Also, we have an initiative that is Caribal, that is like a laboratory of geoscience that involves Dominican Republic efforts, but mainly in Haiti, but this is related also for another Caribbean island. And for me, is something that is very valuable. For example, at this moment, Geohazards International is conducting a project in Haiti about shipping in the schools, kids in action. And I think that can be replicated in the Dominican Republic. Also, we can share data and this kind of geographical information system with Haiti or make some educational programs and trainings. Those are some ideas or opportunities that maybe we can explore in the future. Thank you so much, Dalka. Um, we're really lucky to have Dalka. You can clearly see that she is one the trust and respect of communities in her country. And like Dalka, I'm also hopeful that there can be more sharing across programs, trainings, and other activities between the Dominican Republic and Haiti, something that we're actively exploring um, as well as other nations, uh, Caribbean nations and territories, as they all share very similar contexts and challenges. We're now going to move over to the other side of the world. We're going to move over to South Asia, and we're going to start with Dinesh Yoshi in westernmost part of Nepal, near the border with India. But before we jump in and hear from Dinesh, I want to tell you a little bit of the history of our work in Nepal, just to put Dinesh's remarks into context. So we actually started working in Nepal in the late 1990s, and much of this work focused on school earthquake retrofits in Kathmandu Valley. As part of this, the first ever school earthquake retrofit in Nepal was implemented. It was a highly participatory program with local masons trained and community participation. In the top right photo, you can see our founder and former president, Brian Tucker, as well as the former executive director of our local partner, the National Society of Earthquake Technology, NSET engaging directly with the community. This school retrofit project was part of a larger program where GHI, in collaboration with NSET, worked with local stakeholders to develop an earthquake scenario and action plan for Kathmandu Valley. The priorities identified during this effort became the basis of the work of NSET for the next 20 years, which included hundreds of school retrofits in Kathmandu Valley. Now let's fast forward to 2015 the magnitude 7.8 earth, uh, earthquake that hit Nepal. Nearly 9,000 people died. Over 7,000 schools were destroyed. Fortunately, it was a Saturday, so children were not in school buildings. But the education was interrupted for over a million school children. And today, many schools still have yet to be rebuilt. But looking at the impact from the program that started in the late 1990s, all of the retrofitted schools that had been all the schools that had been retrofitted using methods introduced in the 90s survived without significant damage. And just to show you what we ended up seeing on the ground, on the left, you see, here you see two uh, school buildings. On the left, you see a six classroom school building that completely collapsed. This was not a retrofitted building. And on the right, you see a retrofit, retrofitted building that stood strong. This was using similar technology that was introduced in the late 1990s. So with that background, 
I want I now want to introduce Dinesh. So Dinesh Yoshi is our field engineer for uh, GA China Nepal, and he coordinates earthquake risk reduction activities in Nepal's far west hill districts. He is based in Amargadi municipality. Similar to the program I just talked about in the 90s, GHI developed earthquake scenarios for three districts in western Nepal in 2018. Dinesh was a key member of that effort and is now leading a learn by doing program that resulted from the scenarios. The program is focused on training local engineers and masons on vulnerability assessments and safe building construction of schools. We will now hear directly from Dinesh. Hello, everyone. I am Dinesh Sulsi. Uh, I am a licensed civil engineer in Nepal since 2014. I am currently working with the Geohazard International uh, as a field officer uh, from last five years. Uh, I am based in the Amargadi municipality in my hometown. And my major responsibility is to work with the uh, governmental agencies, local government and other stakeholders of disaster risk reduction. And that was especially focused on the planning, design, and implementation of DRR activities. Uh, before joining the, the Geo Hazards International, I worked with the same Amargadi municipality for two years as a municipal engineer. Uh, that was a good experience for me to know the government priorities, government policies, and uh, rules and norms of uh, the government. And at the start of my professional experience, I worked with the retrofitting project uh, in the most earthquake affected area in 2015 Nepal earthquake. So I was involved in the uh, design, supervision, and construction of the retrofitting work of the private residential building in the Kathmandu, the central part of Nepal. Nepal lies in the Himalayan range and is formed by collision of Indian and Eurasian plate billions of years ago. The 83% of total land of the countries lies in the mountainous and hilly regions with steep slope. And about 50% of population are staying in the, uh, in the hilly areas and mountains. And Ambargadi is also uh, the hill city, lies in the westernmost Nepal, and which is about 20 hours by drive from Kathmandu, the central part of the country. Kathmandu is the capital city of uh, Nepal, as well as uh, the development center of the country. Uh, in the central and uh, western part of the country, we had faced uh, some significant magnitude of quake in uh, recent past. The 1934 Nepal India earthquake, 8.0 magnitude, and uh, um, Nepal earthquake 2015, 7.8 magnitude are the recent ones that we faced. But uh, in the westernmost Nepal, uh, we did not experience the significant magnitude earthquake since. 500 years. It means more the number of years of no big earthquake, more stresses are conserved in between the tectonic plates. Uh, the priorities of the federal government, bilateral agencies, and non governmental agencies are mostly focused on the central part of the country which were affected by the 2015 Nepal earthquake. But in the Western Nepal, uh, there is not much importance given by governmental agencies, bilateral agencies, as well as the development partners. And that's why we are giving the importance to, to Western Nepal on the disaster risk reduction activities. Development is uh, ongoing all over the country after 2015 uh, federal system in Nepal. Under the new constitution of Nepal 2015, the municipalities has control over the budgeting and uh, spending the priorities. 
the municipalities are forming uh, the policies for regulating the uh, regulating the work under the municipality so uh, it's a good time to work with uh, the municipalities uh, to make uh, to make disaster friendly plan and policies it's good time to work because uh, the new federal systems are beginning and uh, we can initiate with good plan and policies that that must be disaster friendly the municipality also have control over uh, the construction of the infrastructure that we may buildings and uh, roads as well as the other uh, infrastructures municipality can play tremendous roles on disaster risk reduction by making disaster resilient infrastructure the level of awareness to hazard and risk on people's is quite low uh, in western nepal as compared to eastern nepal because uh, most of the these activities are uh, are going to conduct in the central part of the country where earthquake uh, strike heavily the construction practice of the building and uh, excavation work the level of importance to drr activities existing policies for construction and excavation work of the governmental agencies leads us to work in the western nepal as i mentioned earlier the municipalities have very important role we have uh, very good supports from the municipality uh, to get uh, the best results from uh, the design activities and uh, the young team of uh, mayors and deputy mayors uh, are very important uh, to work on the disaster resilient infrastructures because they are sustainable the capacity building of the technical personnel uh, on the design quality construction and supervision was the first training that we organized in the uh, municipality uh, this helps the municipality to get the uh, good quality construction and uh, uh, it supports on the design part of the infrastructure and the engineers training on the seismic vulnerability assessments of the uh, school buildings is the recent training that we conducted uh, in the municipality so the municipality now can uh, evaluate their uh, public buildings on their own uh, along with that the uh, sensitization on the uh, earthquake risk and its mitigation are also carried out in some extent uh, to student of the secondary level uh, to make the city resilient lots of things to be done by governmental agencies bilateral agencies as well as ngos so it's uh, good timing to work uh, with the municipalities uh, because uh, we have a uh, good teams of mayors and deputy mayors they are very much excited uh, to work with the development agencies in disaster risk resilient activities thank you dinesh it's really amazing to hear how this is really a good window of opportunity and time for building resilience in nepal as with these new laws local municipalities now have control over their budgets and spending priorities and these are now being led, as you saw, by young men and uh, women who are really excited to make a difference. Um, and this is also happening just during a time of very rapid growth in the area. And as we know, planning, developing, and building with resilience in mind from the beginning is much easier than correcting it later. So with that, we're going to hear from uh, our other panelists in Nepal, from Upama Oja, who brings in the perspective from the national level. Upama is Nepal representative for GHI. She's based in the capital city of Kathmandu, and she supports our programs and partnerships at the national level. This is really important because working across government at all, level, all levels is key to sustaining our efforts. Upama has also been deeply involved in much of the work that we have done in westernmost Nepal, what you just heard from um, the projects and, and efforts that you just heard from Dinesh. She was also the person in charge of ensuring that local people's voices and perspectives were part of our earthquake scenarios and narratives that were developed for the region. We will not hear directly from Upama. Hello everyone, namaste. My name is Upama Oza. I work as national representative for uh, Nepal NGO Azads International. I live in Kathmandu, the capital city of Nepal. 
um, talking about my educational background, I have my master's in physics from um, Delhi University, India. After uh, returning back home, after my master's, I saw various disasters happening around me, floods, landslides, fires every year, and even earthquakes sometimes. Um, also, I realized how poorly we have performed in reducing and managing the risks. And with my background, I thought with some additional qualifications, I could tell if, uh, develop a skill set which could help the community and the country to cope uh, with this situation. And then I did my another master's in science uh, in disaster risk management from the um, uh, Institute of Engineering, Trivan University, Nepal. I uh, practiced my skill set, uh, developed uh, so many others uh, for some years in different organizations. And then in 2017, I joined GSI International and have been working in GSI now for almost um, four and a half years. I feel that my profession uh, puts me in a place where I just don't have to look, uh, stay and remorse the loss of life from disasters. Uh, but, you know, I can actually step up and uh, work for the betterment of uh, humankind. Um, at the 2015 earthquake, uh, which is the most recent earthquake in Nepal, um, uh, killed almost 9,000 people and destroyed thousands of classrooms. Even though school uh, was not in session that day, um, the education of perhaps 1 million students were affected by the damage of school buildings. The built environment has to be strengthened for uh, known earthquake risk. And uh, we have been actively involved in this regard in Nepal. Landslides, uh, which are frequent in past years, are now even more frequent in most of the hill uh, uh, districts due to the unmanaged development in Nepal's hill communities. I'm glad uh, that we have been working on uh, scenarios considering all of these uh, threats and have been working with the communities to make them uh, resilient and um, safer. Uh, the disaster uh, mitigation and preparedness activities that uh, we do, uh, along with making people aware in all levels, really help the community. Um, as you mentioned about uh, the scenario works, uh, Veronica, I was the one who was working on the narratives of the scenarios. Um, since we were working in um, three districts, uh, we were in need of developing three narratives, which uh, actually reflected uh, the real life of the people. Um, we had all uh, all the technical data on infrastructures uh, which we needed, like uh, buildings, uh, bridges, telecommunication, electricity, water supply, health, you know, uh, hospitals and health posts, uh, schools. Um, ETC. Uh, by the time we, we we had already understood the geography of those places, we knew the political and economic structure of the communities. I felt that uh, we still uh, need to know the social composer of the society, how the society and families function on a daily basis. You know, uh, we were uh, we were not looking at an urban setting uh, like Kathmandu, uh, but something different, um, a semi-urban to rural setting. So I started uh, studying the livelihoods of people and try to talk uh, to them as much as possible to the to the locals. Um, I started with the government stakeholders who were empowered to make changes in policies and implementation of important works. I wanted to have their perspective um, as a powerful entity of the society. Uh, you know, I have to mention that in Nepal there is uh, a law that. Uh, deputy mayor or mayor of a municipality, either one of them um, should be a woman, must be a woman. Uh, I was fascinated to see uh, how well uh, they handle everything in the office, the female leaders, and give me their perspective about the social structure. I, I, I uh, got to learn, uh, learn a lot from them, which I um, also used in my story. I want to uh, give you uh, an example 
um, how uh, uh, on how we don't realize things until we actually devote uh, ourselves on learning the community. I want to share uh, one experience with all of you. Um, when I was in one of such rural municipality, I decided to go uh, randomly to a person's house, uh, you know, and uh, uh, talk with them just casually, uh, whoever was present in the house. Um, the people of um, the people in the house they welcomed our team and we started talking. Uh, we came to know that the family was uh, not just a joint family, which is quite prevalent uh, usually in the rural setting, but uh, but had an entangled kind of structure which happened to be quite uh, common in the area, and uh, that was very surprising to me uh, to the entire team. Uh, the house was female headed house, which is again very uncommon in our society. And uh, this was because all the male members of the family went to work in different parts of the country and even abroad. Um, I talked with uh, a kid of the family, you know, with a very um, concerning voice. Oh, okay, uh, so uh, you have to wait uh, till the evening to call your father, phone him once he uh, gets back from work. He replied, no, I can't call him anytime in Facebook. I have data in my mobile. Uh, I was I was so surprised by, by hearing that um, a 14-year-old boy in a rural part of Nepal had his own phone, that too, with uh, working internet. Uh, looking at the house, we would have never guessed um, this thing in, in 100 years. Um, I'm just sharing this story to give an example of how important it is to connect to the community, listen to them, to have uh, an actual picture of them. Without interacting with them, um, we cannot just assume things and develop plans and policies for them, just knowing uh, their language, uh, their country, uh, you know. It's uh, important how we gather the perspectives from uh, all different levels of the community, Veronica. I had an immense experience uh, working with the national stakeholders, the ministries, the central departments, you know. Um, I, I even had worked in the development of national DRR law, disaster risk reduction law. Uh, policies and strategic plans of the country. I, I was quite involved, um, but working with uh, different levels of stakeholders, I realized that um, it is uh, it is crucial to listen to the community people, address their concerns. Uh, staying in the capital city, uh, just hearing from the upper level of people from the municipalities, that's that's not enough. Um, that's not complete. We cannot get the holistic picture of uh, the problem. Um, we cannot get to a sustainable solution with this, uh, with this approach. They have so many stories to uh, say, the community people. They have uh, so much indigenous uh, knowledge with them. Those those need to be heard, analyzed, and uh, used in the right way. We could learn a lot from them. The participation in uh, reaching solution is equally significant. Uh, and that's, how, that, that's actually how I feel. Um, after all, the ultimate goal is to make a safer environment for everyone. Also, we cannot uh, just focus on one um, big sector, one large sector of the problem and skip the so-called smaller problems of the communities, smaller problems to cause um, a loss of lives and properties. It is, it's, it's uh, vital to understand that uh, nobody is safe until, um, unless everyone is safe. Thank you so much, Ubama. What an important point about as outsiders, we can be completely mistaken in our assumptions about a community. It's so important to first really listen and understand a community's realities. And as part of that, not just their vulnerabilities, but also what may be existing strengths, assets, and networks that can be leveraged in our efforts to improve resilience. So now we will move over to Northeast um, India, where we will hear from Lauren Pui Plow, who is based in her home city of Aizal. So uh, Lauren Tweet Blau is Mitigation Specialist for GHI, and in her role, she's in charge of on-the-ground efforts in ISIL. 
Her work has focused on collaborating with local decision makers and other stakeholders on addressing the earthquake and extreme landslide risk in her city. We will now hear directly from Rimpui. I'm Rimpui Klau and I'm based in Aizo in the far northern state of India. I have a master's in social work and I'm the representative at GHI since January 2013. I work from the Disaster Management Department office and I support the government in disaster risk reductions. Before 2013, I was aware that landslide is a big problem, but I was not really aware of the earthquake risk we live with. As you can see, my city lies in the maximum zone for earthquakes. Uh, working on GHI scenario project gives me all the insight of what could go wrong, what can happen, and what we can do to reduce the risk. It was a wonderful experience to work directly with the international and national experts and transferring the knowledge to the local stakeholders and helping my community to become safer. We really needed that help to guide us forward. My hometown, Aizol, is a city which should never have been where it is. Normally, uh, towns and cities develop around um, water sources, but Aizol is right on top of a mountain uh, on a ridge top um, at an elevation of more than 1,000 meters with no water sources nearby. The story goes that 130 years back, uh, the tribes who occupied these hills were fighting a lot. And the British who were ruling India at that time set up a, a military camp on top of the ridge uh, to stop uh, these fightings. And around that uh, military camp, a small uh, village developed, which grew slowly but steadily till the year uh, 2000. But in the last 20 years, um, the population grew from 220,000 to 400,000 today. Um, because of this growth, more and more of the city has been built on uh, steeper slopes and there was hardly any control over the buildings, um, um, how the buildings were constructed. There was little capacity among the engineers on how to build uh, on such steep slopes. So here we are in 2021, a city that grew so fast and around 400,000 people live in a space where about 75,000 could live comfortably. Um, we are among the most risk-prone hill city, uh, not just in the country, but in the region. Capacity building, I believe, does not happen uh, just over a few training programs. Capacity building starts with a clear understanding of the risk, awareness of effects of uh, future hazards, what can happen if the hazard actually strikes, and the knowledge of what can be uh, done to mitigate uh, the risk. Till 2013, we remained blissfully unaware of, though we knew that we had a landslide problem, um, we were not completely aware of what the effects of a future earthquake would be. When GHI and the government prepared the scenario of an earthquake, um, after a detailed study of what would happen, um, we understand what would happen to the water supply line, what would happen to the electricity lines, the roads, hospitals, schools, the buildings, um, and the mountains around Isol, what would happen to the people of Isol. And once the study was completed, um, we realized that um, here is a city of 400,000 people who will possibly lose uh, water the moment an earthquake strikes. Uh, the road connecting to uh, the city to the rest of India will be blocked by landslides. Thousands of buildings will collapse and hospitals will find it difficult to manage. Um, when we became aware of all the risk, we started thinking about the solutions and um, that is when the uh, GHI got the stakeholder departments together and we helped the government um, bring the people working in the geology department, the engineers, the architects, the disaster managers all together in a committee called the Landslide Policy Committee to work out a long-term mitigation plan for ISO. 
And that is in a way a network we created. Um, the people who had not been working together before were working in their own uh, silos, were now working together towards um, a safer ISO. And following the uh, mitigation plan, they developed uh, over the years, they have been ticking boxes of um, actions that have been taken to reduce risk in ISO. They got a landslide hazards map completed. They did long-term uh, training programs for geologists, and they are on their way to employ uh, geologists in the municipality. They are the only municipality in the country who have geologies um, in its roles. So it was really wonderful to see the way uh, my city have uh, progressed uh, from 2013 when we were completely unaware and now um, where we have started uh, taking positive actions uh, to reduce risk and taking steps towards uh, resilience. Wow, thank you so much, Rinpuri. It's really inspiring to hear of ISOL's journey over the past only eight years. I particularly love how this process connected local stakeholders that typically work in silos and created this network. A lot of progress has been made, but we still have a lot left to do. And we're really fortunate to have Rimpui on the ground, continuing to tirelessly, tirelessly promote safer practices and development, not only for the people in Aizal now, but for those of future generations. So next, uh, we will be moving to the capital of India and the city of Delhi where Dr. Hari Kumar is based, one of our most senior and experienced staff members. Hari has been working for GHI for over 15 years. As regional coordinator for South Asia, he's responsible for GHI's work in India, Nepal, Bhutan, and Myanmar. Hari Kumar is a civil engineer with more than 34 years of experience in the field of safe shelter, disaster risk management, and earthquake risk reduction. He brings a wealth of experience and knowledge and is particularly adept at working across the community spectrum from government stakeholders, technical experts, hospital staff to school children. He knows how to deeply engage many diverse groups towards a common goal. We will now hear directly from Hari. It's a real honor to be part of this important event, which I've always seen from far away. Hello everyone, I'm Hari Kumar, a civil engineer working with GHI in the South Asia region since 2005. It's really nice to be doing this plenary as a team from various parts of the world. You know, when they say that the pandemic divided up teams that work together, for us it has almost been the opposite. Uh, maybe because GHI has always been primed for uh, such an eventuality, for it brought our teams together more often, you know, checking in on each other more often, working together on projects we may never have worked together on had we been stuck in the real world with face-to-face -face meetings. Before joining GHI, I had been with uh, UNDP and the government uh, during the formative years of uh, disaster risk reduction in India. And I have been lucky to have been involved in some path-breaking resilience building projects in the region. It, it was such a white canvas. India itself is such a diverse uh, country and working with people from uh, Nepal, Bhutan, Myanmar has been a real fulfilling experience. I've also been lucky to be working on the mitigation side of things. Now, where change may be slow, but results are much, much more satisfying. My doctoral thesis uh, was on mitigation planning. And that is because I really believe that mitigation is God's work. It may not get the attention it deserves, but we just have to keep our shoulders to the wheel and just keep at it. You know, in the last uh, 20 years, we have made progress. It's not as if we have not made progress, but not as much as we would have liked to have. The much wanted um, paradigm shift from reactive response to proactive mitigation may not have happened fully, but it may also be because we are increasing the risk so fast that our mitigation efforts are not catching up. You know, it's time I'm remembering the quote from Alice in Wonderland where the Red Queen tells Alice, my dear, 
here we must run as fast as we can just to stay in place. And if you wish to go anywhere, you must run twice as fast as that. I think it applies to our mitigation efforts also. I don't think our mitigation efforts are at the pace or the depth that we need it to be. And the progress that, that I was talking about in the last 20 years has not been uniform uh, across countries or even within countries. And it is no surprise that uh, you know local leadership has made a lot of difference in the in the successful places. And I'm just remembering the first time I went to Isol about 10 years back. Enpu had not joined by then, and being awestruck by the risk, it was so visible to me. It was in my face, but I was looking around, and nobody around me uh, was affected by this. I, I, I sent photos uh, to my colleagues in, in GHI and, and uh, said, you know, you remember uh, what we say in our mission statement about at-risk, underserved communities. I'm with them now and it looks like they need a lot of help. And as in many projects, you know, we went through the process, the struggle to find funding, finding the perfect uh, local government department, understanding uh, the change makers in the community, finding uh, the change makers in the community, that's an important step that we do in most projects that I'd like to spend a minute on that. We collect information and find out how the community works, who makes the decisions, how they make the decisions, who are the change makers, who are the elected leaders, who are the ones who may not be elected but are still leaders who influence the community. We develop what is uh, what we loosely we call the uh, the community characterizer, which is loosely modeled on EPA's guide uh, to understanding a sense of place. And then we bring in the, the local person like Rinpoche or Dinesh, who lives there, who understands the context, who brings people together, works within their office, and generally keeps resilience building at the table. At every table, you know, they could very well be, be planning their uh, office New Year party, but resilience and safety will be at the table. And we realized the power of this local uh, influencer when we were working with the Tibetan community in exile. The Tibetan community in exile in India uh, live among natural hazards at the epicenter of one of the most devastating earthquakes that hit us the April 4th Kangda earthquake of 1905. And, and our project in, in, in with the Tibetan community was to retrofit a museum. And, and we had hired a, a young Tibetan boy to keep the project moving. The young man, Sering, uh, he loved working with this community. And, and with a little bit of training, he, would, he went to uh, Tibetan schools uh, and trained on preparedness and initiated an all school preparedness drill in 2008, inspired by the California shakeup. And, and that drill, the next year, the, the, the government schools of, of the state also took part in this, in this drill. And soon, you know, it had gone way beyond the community and is now a regular feature in the annual calendar in schools across the Himalayas. The local leaders, the local influencers, they can do magic. But we have to invest in them and see them grow into these community influencers. They magnify, multiply the effects and the reach that an international expert can bring. They can get the local um, you know, engineers together in a, in, in a room and demand time from a renowned earthquake engineer in, in, in California. You know, an engineer like Bill Holmes, who co-authored several FEMA guides to answer questions and help solve problems of our, uh, of our engineers in the community over a Skype call or a Zoom call. And on the other side, we have been blessed to have people such as Bill or, or Tom Tobin, you know, the ex-director of California Seismic Safety Commission 
and others who will happily give time to enhance capacities in a faraway land. Along with developing capacities, it's also important to keep these leaders motivated and, and help them take those informed decisions with our community influencers leading them from the side. You know, they are leading them enough to be able to tell them, yes, I think that road to the top of the hill, uh, uh, to the viewpoint may be very important. But will that make our water supply lines below vulnerable to landslides? Maybe you should get the water guys and, and, and the geologist to take a more careful look. You know, it is, it is here that our influencer helps our leader to take the right decisions. It's also important, you know, for us to do everything we can to help these leaders uh, succeed and, and to become the champions of resilience. And we need more and more champions at all levels. These communities are going to be affected by disastrous events sooner than later. You know, and in this plenary theme, I was reading the, the paragraph written uh, about the theme, and, and I noticed this mention of a major environmental injustice in the hard time, which had me thinking about an, an event which happened earlier this year. A glacier failure induced flood killed hundreds in North India near uh, this the, the, the rainy village in, in, in Uttarakhand. Tiny village is, is close to my heart because it has been the women of this village who hugged trees to prevent logging in their woods in 1973. That is what started this tree hugging campaign across the country, across the world. They had done their bit to protect the environment. But 50 years down the line, they were affected by events originating far away and even lost three of their own community members, but their resilience shines through. And that is the key, building local resilience. And a similar can be the case with Bhutan, a carbon neutral country, you know, or e even carbon negative. Imagine a country which has little left to do in climate change mitigation, but has still has to invest in, invest in adaptation. Bhutan can surely be affected by future disastrous events and must continue to invest in resilience. And we, the, the external global community, needs to invest in enhancing their capacities. And we must invest in such places where we can create successes and then work at a higher a global level to replicate these local successes. But it starts and ends with enhancing local capacities. Because the risk may be global, resilience truly local. Thank you so much. Wow, Hari, those were incredibly powerful statements. I couldn't agree more. Resilience is definitely local, and we need to invest in the people who are committed locally and who will be there for the long run. So, for our last panelist, unfortunately, uh, Yi Shi Lote from Bhutan could not join us today as he had a close family member suddenly pass away. We wanted to keep Yi Shi in our program as he's a key team member in our efforts, not only in Bhutan, but also throughout the region. We miss him dearly today and wish him strength through this difficult time. Yi Shi is based in the capital, Fimpu, of his home country of Bhutan. As national coordinator, he oversees all of our on the ground work in the country. The country of Bhutan also sits along the Himalayan mountains, one of the most seismically active places in the world, as we've already heard today. Yi Shi is especially well placed to work with key local stakeholders and decision makers, as he previously worked as executive engineer for the Department of Disaster Management and as chief engineer for the Construction Development Board of the country. GHI has done extensive work on seismic safety in the country since 2011. More recently, we started exploring working on climate-related threats. As you already heard from Hari, Bhutan is the only country in the world that is carbon negative, meaning that it absorbs more carbon emissions than it emits. It is a carbon sink, thanks to the fact that over 70% of the country is covered in forest. This is per the Bhutanese constitution, which requires a minimum of 60% forest cover. 
Yet tragically, Bhutan is a country that is very prone to the effects of climate change, including the danger of rapidly melting glaciers, which they are already experiencing. Hari, who you just heard from, has kindly agreed to provide insights on the experience in Bhutan. Hari has been involved in our work in Bhutan since day one, starting back in 2011, so he is very well positioned to provide thoughts and reflections. Hari will tell us more about Bhutan in general, and in particular, how its uniqueness in culture and values ties into its approach to disaster preparedness and mitigation. Yes, we are all very saddened that Eshe could not be here with us. I know he had been looking forward to this, and I know he would have told you all about the wonderful things that he is doing with the government, how he is working with which departments and all of that. I cannot even actually try to be a poor replacement for him. But I will give you an outsider's perspective. Bhutan had been affected by an earthquake in 2009, you know, one hour which, which came after hundreds of years. And almost all activities in building resilience started after that. So whatever progress we see in Bhutan, you know, in disaster resilience has been made in the last decade. We helped conduct the first school safety training of trainers in 2010, barely months after the, that earthquake. But they made quick strides in the field. You know, quick enough that the education department and me felt ready to conduct a nationwide school preparedness drill in 2013. Every school going child in Bhutan, you know, every child in every school of Bhutan took part in the drill on the anniversary of that quake. This was observed uh, by uh, the education minister and, and, and members of the royal family. And, and uh, the minister himself announced that this will be an annual event. And sure enough, every school in Bhutan takes part in the annual school preparedness drill in September every year, marks the anniversary of the quake. That is Bhutan. We just have to plant the seeds. They will make sure it grows and sustains. We worked with hospitals, conducting assessments, uh, training engineers to do, to, to do assessment of hospitals, to assess non-structural hazards, and how to keep hospitals functional, and, and also staff members uh, to be prepared uh, for all emergencies, like earthquakes, windstorms, landslides. But we never discussed pandemics. But still, look at how they did. One death. Just one death in the whole pandemic. That's what let it remain like that. That is local residents for you. If we were to assume that Bhutan doesn't need technical assistance, we would be mistaken. They really do. They're going to be affected by climate change, earthquakes. But if we invest here, invest in local resilience here, the, the results will be much, much more positive here than in several other countries. That is Bhutan. Thank you. Yes. We are all very. I completely agree with Hari. Bhutan's values and way of being is truly remarkable and inspiring. Um, so thank you so much to all of our panelists for all their perspectives. I'm going to wrap up the last couple of minutes uh, with some key takeaways. And so first, the urgency is clearer than ever. We are facing a staggering increase in risk globally a climate crisis, and deepening inequities resulting in even more disproportionate impacts. And although our particular organization has traditionally focused on low and middle income countries, disproportionate impacts are pervasive in our own backyard here in the United States. These are complex, dynamic, and interrelated problems, so it's an all hands on deck situation. Disaster resilience is no longer just a topic for particular professionals. It's affecting every aspect of our lives and needs to be addressed accordingly. Now more than ever, we need a paradigm shift where there's more emphasis on proactive measures and disaster resilience needs to be at every table, 
as Hari so eloquently expressed. And as was beautifully noted by Chancia Willis in the keynote yesterday, diversity is the best kept secret. It's a strength, it's a superpower. We may not have all the answers now, but we have so much that we can learn from each other and diverse perspectives can help us navigate these uncharted waters. Diverse perspectives can also help us uncover ways that we can leverage local strengths and networks to help build resilience. My last slide, I wanna just end by stressing that resilience is local and a long-term process. It needs an approach to match. This workshop's theme is spot on as this approach requires building and investing in the workforce necessary to take on these urgent, unprecedented threats we are facing. It involves investing in people and investing locally. Thank you. And with that, I wanna give a very special thanks to our panelists for sharing their perspectives. A big thank you to the Natural Hazards Workshop organizers for this great opportunity. And to all of you listening today for your questions, your comments, and your support. Thank you so much, Veronica, and thank you to the entire Geohazards International team. I hope that all the participants out there that you will share your gratitude, continue to share your gratitude in the text box. Um, Rinpui, when you were speaking, one of the things you said was, when we became aware of all the risks, we started thinking about the solutions. And that's what I thought, that is the heart of Geohazards International. And thank you so much for the work you do all around this world. And thank you for honoring us with this plenary session today. And Veronica, already many people are asking for the videos, slides, and so forth. So we will look forward to sharing those with our participants. So thank you. Thank you to Geohazards International. Thank you to our participants. And a few quick announcements before we break for a long lunch. And so first and foremost to all of our workshop participants out there, I hope that you will acknowledge and thank the extraordinary student volunteers who have been making this workshop run so smoothly and run on time along with the Natural Hazard Center team. And a special thanks to Jocelyn West and Melissa Villarreal who um, selected this amazing group of volunteers and have been working so closely with them. And so a big round of applause to the volunteers and please make sure you thank your student volunteers in your sessions. Um, we also wanted to give a big shout out to Elise Bernbach, who has been capturing these plenary sessions, the keynote from yesterday. Um, the Natural Hazard Center has been posting these graphic recordings on Twitter and also on our website. And so we also hope you will give Elise a big thanks for sharing her talents again with us this year. And Geohazards International team, Elise was trying to capture all the richness of this session, but I know that's gonna be a hard task. Um, just four quick announcements. Number one, if you haven't signed up for the Natural Hazards Mitigation Association practitioners meeting, there is still time. It's on Thursday after this workshop ends. Um, also, if you're looking for continuing education credit for attending this workshop, please do uh, visit the Natural Hazards Center workshop page so you can learn more about how you can earn contact hours from the Association of State Floodplain Managers and or the International Association of Emergency Managers, and we are so thankful for their partnership. We also, again, wanted to invite everyone to join us this evening from 5.30 to 7 for a special session in honor of Dennis Maletti. And then last but not least, there is still time to sign up for the Disaster Dash and to run, walk wherever you are in the world and to support the amazing Bill Anderson Fund. So we hope you will check that out and take part. And last but not least, we are wishing you all a restorative 90 minutes away from the computer screen. We hope have a great break, have um, a, a, a great hour and a half away and concurrent sessions will resume in an hour and a half at 1.30 Mountain Time. And so thank you so much, everyone. Thanks again to the Geohazards International team for being with us. It was again, a true honor to learn from you. Have a great lunch, everyone. Take care. <laughs>